Well, good morning, and it's good to see so many of you here this morning. It's great to be in the house of the Lord on the Sabbath morning. We've been talking about the um, Great Controversy Project, and I, I see it's mentioned in the bulletin, and I'd like you to bring, bring your attention to those things that are listed in the, in the bulletin uh, this week, especially in regards to Vindy Smith. If you want to go and see her, please, please make an appointment. But in regards to the Great Controversy Project, we're not the only ones. This book has been uh, produced in Switzerland, and uh, it's The Great Controversy, and it's been printed in, in Germany. Isn't that a fantastic book? And it's been given out regularly. Uh, there's also an, uh, half the size of it's an A5 version, but this book is, is absolutely amazing. When you look at the contents of it, it's all illustrated with pictures uh, all the way through, and... Uh, it's getting a wonderful response. So if anyone wants to have a look at that book later on, uh, please do. It's, uh, it's great to see. They've also got a new uh, print of Steps to Christ, and uh, they're going very well too. So just in the, um, in the German uh, conference, there's been over 6,000 of these books being given out. So praise the Lord. Um, we're not the only ones. And uh, we're not finished yet either. We've still got books to give out. So praise the Lord. Um, we also bring you, again, greetings from Carmen. She rang this morning and uh, just uh, to see how we're all doing and that uh, everything's going well here uh, in, in Wongarei, New Zealand. We were lucky. And uh, I'll just uh, get this ready and I'll just ask you to bring that up on the screen, Lou. That's the right one. Oh, hang on. No, it's not. Something's, uh, something's added, happened to my uh, thing here. Yeah, this is the one. We'll start with that one. That's the one. Great. In October the 11th, 1531, a very important man died. All throughout the Swiss valleys, there were bells clanging at the death of this great man. And I know you can't see that picture too well, but this is the, the war at Kappel in the Canton Schwitz in the middle of Switzerland, where this man, the great Swiss reformer, unshakable as the mountains, was killed by Roman soldiers. My Ulrich Swingley, and it's amazing to think that God had a wonderful plan um, for this man. This is a, a statue to his memory, just on the Limit River in the middle of Zurich. And uh, yeah, amazing to think that that city of Zurich was a stronghold for Protestantism. God had a wonderful plan for this world. After the Dark Ages, we had the birth of the Reformation. And it was only a couple of weeks after the birth of Martin Luther in Germany that Ulrich Swingley was born in the Alps of Switzerland in a little place called Wildhaus, right? And this here is the valley uh, where he grew up. You can see, not again very clearly, but you can see these mountain ridges, seven mountain ridges, and it's down here in this valley where Ulrich Swingley grew up. And Marianne and I were lucky to find this information out because it was only one hour away from where we were residing. This here is the little house in which Ulrich Swingley grew up. And you know, it was amazing. Upon entering this little house um, here in Wildhaus, Switzerland, I was overcome with gratitude. Gratitude for this man that paid a huge price that we can sit here today and have the freedom of the gospel. Amen. And the humbling, the humble abode of this house. Here are the Bibles that he used. And um, here's also a portrait of him also from uh, Ulrich Swingley. Absolutely amazing in the conditions that these, uh, that these men uh, grew up in. And like I said, it was really humbling to be in, in his house. There you can see the kitchen. Um, it's a bit fuzzy. Uh, uh, I wasn't standing too straight there, or what? I don't know what happened. And of course, the bed in which 
they slept in. Really humble abode, all timber. Heating had to be done, um, you know, by collecting wood and, uh, and burning it. And, of course, on the other wall are the 67 theses that Swingley wrote. Swingley himself, in his childhood, as I mentioned before, was surrounded by these beautiful Swiss mountains. To prepare him for his future mission, reared him in among scenes of wonderful grandeur. The history of the brave deeds achieved upon his native, on his native mountains kindled his youthful aspirations. At the side of his pious grandmother, he listened to the few precious Bible stories which she had gleaned from amid the legends and traditions of the church. With eager interest, he heard of the grand deeds of patriarchs and prophets, of the shepherds who watched their flocks on the hills of Palestine, where angels talked with them, of the babe of Bethlehem and the man of Calvary. Like John Luther, however, Swingley's father desired an education for his son, and it wasn't long before he left his, his uh, native home in the valleys of, um, of Switzerland. His mind rapidly developed, and it soon became a question where to find teachers competent to instruct such a young, inquiring mind. At the age of 13, he went to Bern, the, uh, the capital of Switzerland, which then possessed the most distinguished school in Switzerland. However, determined efforts were put forth by the friars and the Dominican and Franciscan monks. They endeavoured to secure, uh, by their showy adornments of their churches, the pomp of their ceremonies and the attractions of famous relics and miracle-working images to attract this young man to work uh, for them. Providentially, his father received information of the designs of the friars. He had no intention of allowing his son to follow the idle and worthless life of a monk. He saw that his future usefulness was at stake and directed him to return home without delay. He, the command was obeyed, and, but the youth could not be long content in his native valley and soon resumed his studies, repairing after a time to Basel up on the northwest side of Switzerland. It was here that Swingley first heard the gospel of God's free grace. Wittenbach, a teacher of the ancient languages, had while studying Greek and Hebrew been led to the Holy Scriptures and thus, raised, and thus divine light was shared into the minds of the students under his destruction, in, instruction. He declared that there was a truth more ancient than philosophers. This ancient truth was the death of Christ is the sinner's only ransom. To Swingley, these words were at the first, as the first ray of light that precedes the dawn. The, he gave his life to Christ in 1504, 508 years ago. Swingley was soon called from his studies in Basel, Basel to enter upon his life work. His first field of labour was in the Alpine parish in a place called Glarus, which is about uh, 50 k's from where he grew up. He devoted himself with his whole soul to the search after divine truth, for he was well aware, says a fellow reformer, how much he must know to whom the flock of Christ is entrusted. The more he searched the scriptures, the clearer appeared the contrast between their truths and the heresies of Rome. He submitted himself to the Bible as the word of God, the only sufficient and fallible rule. He saw that it must be its own interpreter. He dared not attempt to explain scripture to sustain a preconceived theory or doctrine, but held it his duty to learn what it is, what is its direct and obvious teachings. 
He sought to avail himself of every help to obtain a full and correct understanding of its meaning, and he invoked the aid of the Holy Spirit, which be, he declared, reveal it to all who sought it in sincerity and with prayer. The scripture said, so when we come from God, not from man. And even that God who enlightens will give thee to understand that the speech comes from God. The word of God cannot fail. It is bright. It teaches itself. It dis discloses itself. It illuminates the soul with all salvation and grace. Comforts it in God, humbles it so that it loses and even forfeits itself and embraces God. The truth of these words Swingley himself had proved. Speaking of his experience at this time, he afterward wrote, When I began to give myself wholly up to the Holy Scriptures, philosophy and theology would always keep suggesting quarrels to me. At last I come to this, that I thought, Thou must let all that lie and learn the meaning of God purely out of his own simple word. Then I began to ask God for his light, and the scriptures became, for me, much easier to understand. The doctrine preached by Swingley was not received from Luther. It was the doctrine of Christ. If Luther preaches Christ, said the Swiss reformer, he does what I am doing. Those whom he has brought to Christ are more numerous than those whom I have led, but this matters not. I will bear no other name than that of Christ Jesus, whose soldier I am and who alone is my chief. That's why we sang those songs this morning, because we are all in God's army. Never has any one single word been written by me to Luther, nor by Luther to me. And why? that it might be shown how much the Spirit of God is in unison with itself, since both of us, without any conclusion, teach or collusion, teach the doctrine of Christ with such uniformity. And isn't that an amazing, yeah, with, the, with the gospel? We can have a sermon here today, and it can be preached exactly the same or similar somewhere else in the world, because truth is truth. In 1516... Swingley was invited to become a preacher in the convent at Einsiedeln in Canton Schwitz. Here he was to have a closer view of the corruptions of Rome and was to exert an influence as a reformer that would be felt far beyond his native Alps. Among the chief attractions of Einsiedeln was an image of the Virgin Mary, which was said to have the power of working miracles. Above the gateway of the convent was the inscription... Here, a plenary remission of sin may be obtained. Pilgrims at all seasons resorted to the Shrine of the Virgin, but at that great yearly um, festival, people travelled from France and Germany. Swingley, greatly affected at the sight, seized the opportunity to proclaim liberty through the gospel to these bond slaves of superstition. He said, do not imagine that God is in this temple more than any other part of creation. Whatever be the country in which you dwell, God is around you and hears you. Can unprofitable works, long pilgrimage, offerings, images, the invocation of the Virgin or of the saints secure for you the grace of God? What avails the multitudes of words with which he embodied our prayers? God looks at the heart, and our hearts are far from him. Christ, he said, who was once offered upon the cross, is the sacrifice and victim. He had made sac satisfaction for the sins of all believers for all, all eternity. And of course, to many listeners, these teachers were unwelcome. These teachings were unwelcome. It was a bitter, dis a bitter disappointment to them that he told that their toilsome journey had been made in vain. But another class received with gladness the tidings of redemption through Christ. The observances enjoyed by Rome had failed to bring peace of soul 
and in faith they accepted the Saviour's blood as their appropriation. These returned to their homes to reveal to others the precious light with which they had received. The truth was thus carried from village to village, from hamlet to hamlet, from town to town, and the number of pilgrims to the Virgin Shrine greatly lessened. There was a falling off in the offerings and consequently in the salary of Swingley, which was drawn from them. But this caused him only joy as he saw that the power of fanaticism and superstition was being broken. Naturally, the authorities of the church weren't happy with what was happening. Swingley's labors, labors at Einsiedeln had prepared him for a, wild, wild, sorry, a wider field, and this he was soon to enter. After three years, he was called to the office of preacher in the cathedral at Zurich. And I think I have a picture of this one. And there, it, oops, sorry, a bit further. And here's the cathedral uh, in Zurich, the Grossmünster, to which um, it's one of three where he worked. But I don't know whether you can see it. I think you can see it on this one, yeah? It's very hard to see. But just here, written but, um, below the, um, the window here, um, is the words that here in this church is where Ulrich Swingley commenced the Reformation. And um, it's just an amazing church. It's not like the Catholic churches. They are full of pomp and, and, uh, and everything else with statues and everything. But this one was very plain inside. And on this bronze door, you can see uh, inscriptions of these different relics. And all these um, relics um, display the story of the Reformation. Absolutely amazing. Here we have one, two, and it actually talks about uh, the three re uh, reformers, Swingley, Vadian, and uh, I can't read the, read the third name. But uh, absolutely amazing to be uh, in the city where one of the top reformers uh, was working. And of course, here are bo uh, words from the Bible, um, written in the German language, of course. But uh, it's just an amazing uh, cathedral. So here he was called, and uh, here he worked. And it was amazing when he arrived at the cathedral, which was at that time under the influence of Rome, he said um, the authorities of the church were not blind to the work which Swingley was accomplishing, but for the present they forbade to interfere. And they said to him when he came here to Zurich, um, you will make every exertion, they said, to collect the revenues of the chapter without overlooking the least, you will exhort the faithful both from the pulpit and in the confessional to pay all tithes and Jews and to show by their offerings their affection to the church. You will be diligent in increasing the income arising from the sick, from masses, and in general from their very ecclesiastical ordinance. As for the administration of the sacraments, the preaching and the care of the flock, added his instructors, these are also the duties of the chaplain. But for these you may employ a substitute, in particular in preaching. You should administer the sacraments to none but persons of note. And only then, and only when called upon, you are forbidden to do so without distinction of persons. Absolutely amazing, isn't it? How they tried to dictate how he was supposed to present the gospel. But he simply re re, uh, replied to this. He says, um, uh, though some of the... Uh, sorry, I've got my wrong page here. He simply replied that, no, I won't do that. I will preach from the gospel as, uh, as presented by Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, too, that although his, uh, his preaching was received with great enthusiasm... Um, after a time, opposition arose. The monks set themselves to hinder his work and condemn his teachings. Many assailed with jibes and sneers. Others resorted to insolence and threats. But Swingley bore all with patience, saying, If we desire to gain over the wicked to Jesus Christ, we must shut our eyes against many things. Thus the light found 
entrance. At that time, God was preparing to break the shackles of ignorance and superstition. Then it is that Satan's works with greatest power to enshroud men in darkness and to bind their fetters with still more firmly. And it's amazing, you know, the, the Rome sent people up from, uh, from Rome to try and influence the, uh, the churches. For example, in Germany, the sale of indulgences had been committed to the Dominican friars and was conducted by the infamous Tetzel. In Switzerland, the traffic was put under the hands of the Franciscans under the control of Samson, an Italian monk, and uh, he had already done good service to the church, having secured immense sums from attracting great crowds, despoiling the poor peasants of their scanty earnings and exacting rich gifts from the wealthy classes. But the influence of the reform already made itself felt in curtailing though it could not stop the traffic. Swingley was still at Einsiedel when Samson uh, arrived from Rome and um, being appraised of his mission, the reformer immediately set about to oppose him. The two did not meet, but such was Swingley's success in exposing the friar's pretensions that he was obliged to leave to other quarters. He also met him in Zurich and, uh, and told him that he wasn't welcome there and... Uh, Samson soon left uh, Switzerland. And of course we, we know that um, there was a battle constantly raging as these reformers held up the flag for the gospel. And it was in this place here, this is where the city of Baden, where Marianne and I lived for 12 years, but it was through these gates that uh, when uh, Sw Swingley's um, supporters or representatives were defending the, the work of the Reformation that, um, that uh, these little young lads or students were sent to take letters to Swingley and, uh, at, uh, at night and then Swingley would return them um, in the morning and uh, to allow these students to come in through these gates they used to um, put um, chickens on their heads and uh, have the letters um, hidden in their jackets and uh, it's amazing when you think that all this happened in an area that we were visiting or that we, that we lived in. And, uh, and of course, the Catholic Church said, well, we won the victory over Swingley, but in all essence, the victory was won by the Protestant Church because after that, the, um, the uh, Reformation made a, a stronghold in the city of Bern and Basel. And it's amazing when you travel through, through Switzerland today and you you know, go for a hike up a mountain. On every mountain highest peak, there's a cross. And there's words to the extent to say, like uh, from a psalm or something, written on a, on a tablet somewhere, you know. And to think that this country had played such a big part in the Reformation and to see what is happening today, the total extreme, whereby luxury is preventing people from wanting to know God. Sad. And why have I concentrated on the Reformation today. The Reformation, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, played an important part in history in that we have the freedom of the gospel again today. And, uh, you know, we all need to remember the sacrifice of these great men, uh, what they did, that we could have our freedom. And when I think of it, you know, about, just about that word Reformation or reform, how is it with us today? Are we reforming our lives? Are we experiencing a reformation in our lives today? You know, and I think of different things that we do. And this morning uh, in the Sabbath school, we were talking about our prayer group, you know. Are we keen to go and support our, our, our prayer group? You know, a lot of us have got time that we don't know what to do with during the week, and, um, and some of us haven't, of course. But I think if we go and support our prayer group and pray with that group, pray for others, pray for the growth of the church, pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, if we're not doing that, then we need a reformation in our lives. And I think too, you know, our young people are getting tied up with our social networking and other things that influence them. And I think they need to take account of where they're at and a reformation should take place in their lives. 
as a church, as officers in the church, we should be supporting one another, not pulling each other down, not slandering one another's names. If we're doing that, then we need a reformation in our lives. You know, it is amazing to think that we are so close to the end. And uh, some people will say, oh, no, no, we've got plenty of time. But we need a reformation in our own lives. In the book of Psalms, chapter 19, verse 7, it simply says here, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Make wise, making wise the simple. Converting the soul. We need conversions not once a year, not once a month. We need a conversion every day of our lives. You know, we've been challenged too, having a young man staying with us and having lots of questions. And I'm thankful for his questions because they make us realize that uh, we don't take everything for granted. We should have an answer for the hope that we have. That's why conversion is necessarily necessary on a daily basis. Psalm 51 verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. You know, if we go out and spread the gospel message, because there is no hope other than the gospel message for the world today, when you think there are people lying on the streets of Europe begging, um, and yet it's such a, uh, a wealthy, influ influential country, uh, not only in Switzerland, but throughout Germany and, and the other countries of the European Union, you know, these people need to know the good news of the gospel. And if we tell them, then they will be converted through the power of the Holy Spirit. But we need to get out of our comfort zone. We also need a reformation. Matthew 18, verse 3, and it simply says, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Powerful words, aren't they? That's why we need a conversion. That's why we need a reformation in our lives. Reform our ways. You know, if TV is taking up too much of your time and you're not spending time in the word of God, you need a reformation in your life. And don't worry, I'm talking to myself here uh, also. Second Timothy chapter 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead in his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry, of thy ministry. We are all called to be disciples, we are all called to be priests, and to minister the truth of the gospel. I constantly thank the Lord that I belong to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The truth has been revealed to this church and just uh, while in Switzerland, I came in contact with a lady visiting my mother-in-law. And it was so sad to see that this lady had reached the age of 84 and was confused about the gospel issues. We just pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, she was able to listen uh, to what we presented to her. And we always claim the promise that when we give God's word out, that it will not return to him empty, but will fulfill the purpose and that it was given. So I encourage you this week, people, to get out there and tell others of the wonderful love. Why should we keep it to ourselves when Jesus says, you are my disciples? And I'd like to finish on this note on Matthew 4.19. These disciples were humble and teachable. The disciples, the reformers, the less they had been influenced by the false teachings of their time, the more successfully could Christ instruct and train them for his service. So in the days of the Great Reformation, the leading reformers were men from humble life, men who were most free of any of their time, from pride of rank, and from influence of bigotry and priesthood.